Hello, my name is Deanna Lanaway, and I'm an executive consultant with People First HR Services. I have worked with Emily Toth, one of our HR consultants who specializes in compensation, to create today's informational webinar on the MCCA sector salary guidelines. So in our short presentation, we're going to be talking about the history of our projects with MCCA, how we developed the guidelines, and how they were updated this year. We're also going to talk a little bit about why we use the approach that we do. Thanks so much for joining us. So we plan to describe the work that we've done over more than a decade of collaborating with MCCA. Then we're just going to highlight what an organizational compensation philosophy is and why it's important for a center to consider theirs or maybe to create one as it forms a foundation for their pay decisions. Then we're going to provide an overview of our methodology, how we selected the comparators that we used and why we do include alternative careers. Then we're going to go into how you can use the sector guidelines as you're budgeting or making pay decisions. Lastly, we're going to talk just a little bit about retention factors because pay is only one piece of how you keep your most valuable employees. So we do know that MCCA has been active with sector salaries for decades. I won't go too deep into the history, but we do know that by 1999, MCCA had developed a guideline salary scale for group child care centers. Known as phase one, these guidelines were designed to be a first step in ele elevating wages for directors, supervisors, ECEs, and child care assistants. Then following phase one, MCCA introduced a number of subsequent sal salary scales. And in 2007, they engaged us to collaborate with them. So People First HR Services is a Winnipeg-based HR consulting firm. We have an active compensation practice and a wealth of information about our region's labor market. So at that time, we were hired to undertake a major review to develop a market competitive salary guideline scale. This new salary guideline scale was aiming to better reflect market rates, enabling the childcare sector to compete more effectively with other sectors that have similar or what we would call comparable jobs. To do so, a detailed review was conducted of the positions that were found in group childcare centers, which included identification of jobs in other sectors of comparable worth, considering what we know to be common job evaluation factors. Um, so then in 2008, you know, we teamed up with MCCA to hold a workshop for Manitoba childcare providers who were struggling to find talent. And a very big component of that workshop was compensation. In 2009, we used fresh market data to update the 2007 report. And we did so again in 2014. From 2015 until 2021, the report was indexed. So now in 2022, there have been many changes in both the labor market and the funding environment. So it was once again time to update the 2014 market report using fresh data. Now, when we work with clients on compensation projects and we're dealing with a single employer, we recommend that they establish and use a compensation philosophy. It basically establishes where you as an organization want to position yourselves in the market. The purpose of them is to basically give you the why around compensation for your employees. A compensation philosophy would typically be comprised of the following components. A purpose that links to the organization's mission, vision, and values. Um, the goals of the compensation program. So for example, to reward employees for tenure or performance, to provide a living wage. Um, 
or maybe tying to internal or external equity. Uh, then defining the labor market that's most relevant for you. So that means what is the sector or the industry, the employee size organization, the revenue size organization, the geographic location? How do you compare yourself to specific organizations? And then defining market positioning. So market positioning means the 25th or maybe the 50th or the 75th percentile. The majority of organizations do pay at the 50th percentile, meaning that 50% of organizations out there in their comparable market will pay more than them. And 50% of the organizations will pay less. That's considered market competitive. Um, the compensation philosophy will often also include the total rewards mix because wages are more than just hourly rates or salaries alone. It includes base pay, base pay increases, um, bonuses, benefits, perquisites, um, or maybe, you know, even including total time off. Um, and then, of course, the last piece of a compensation philosophy philosophy would be authority and accountability. That identifies who has the power to make adjustments to the policy and who the policy applies to. Um, it also includes the review period. How many times are you going to look at it and think about how many, um, whether you need to make any changes. And so a compensation philosophy that includes all of those co components really just works within the market guidance that we provide. So the market guidance provides information that you can use to inform your decision. Obviously, it, there, are, there are always practical funding realities. But your compensation philosophy, including all of those components, really helps you understand everything that you need to consider using the market guidance to make your pay decisions. So starting with the 2007 report, we focused on the roles and understanding what makes people successful in them. That comes down to things like education, experience, the scope of authority that each person has in those roles. They're all important to understand so that we can establish similar roles, both within the sector and outside of it. That would come down to those defining comparators. As some of the role descriptors changed over the years, MCCA, of course, did provide us information. So year over year, we understood if any of the roles within the sector changed, did we have to make changes in the comparators that we had defined? We're going to talk a little bit more about defining comparators in a few minutes, because the process of finding the right comparator is definitely important. But once we have our comp comparators, then we look to the market and determine what people are being paid in those roles. This data is a combination of both our own proprietary data for the market and published surveys that we pay to access as a vital part of our compensation practice. And then we blended the rates using both what's being paid in the sector today and what is being paid in alternative careers to create the ranges that you see in the guidelines. So I said we would talk a little bit about the comparators. Now, this comes down to the job matching process. We've been proud to work with MCCA since 2007, and the comparators have changed a little bit since that time, but largely have stayed the same to ensure as much consistency as possible in the scales. Over, you know, over a 15-year period, that's significant. Job matching is a critical success factor to an effective market review. And market review forms the core of the salary scales for MCCA. This is the process where we decide which benchmark jobs from compensation surveys or our own proprietary data should be used in order to assess the market price of a position. When we do market reviews for private employers, 
we seek to find the most similar job, not only in matching the job title and the region, but also the size of the organization based upon employees, based upon revenue, and the general accountabilities of the role. Now, when we do a sector analysis like this one for MCCA, we were not seeking to find out what the closest jobs are, since childcare as a sector is quite well defined. There are some obvious matching in the educational system, of course, but looking beyond that, we want to see what kind of careers people should choose or could choose instead. Many individuals are open to retraining to begin a different career, and that could be at any point in their lives. And compensation can be one of those factors that drive choices. Back in 2007, in collaboration with MCCA, we determined what an appropriate match was, both within the sector and outside of the sector. This is common in all organizations, by the way. When we do a market review, we typically look both for appropriate matches within the defined labor market of the organization, but also expanding that search into sectors or industries where you would either recruit employees from or lose employees to. So for example, if we're working with a rural municipality, someone who operates a large piece of equipment on the roads could possibly go to work for another nearby municipality. So that is relevant, what they pay across, you know, across another municipality. But if our client is concerned that they may leave, this operator may leave to go work in either agriculture um, or maybe in the construction industry, we might expand the search to include organizations in those other industries. Job matching always considers and matches the scope of the organization. So that's determined by revenue and employee size um, and the level of experience and education related to the job. So if a job in one sector requires five years of experience and two years of education, we're going to look for a job in another sector that maybe would match that. And we don't compare salaries between a company like RBC, for example, and a nonprofit like a charity delivering programming to new immigrants. They simply cannot be compared, even if some pieces of the job are the same. When we're matching, we find the comparison roles and their compensation data. As I mentioned, we use data from a number of different sources, dynamic, consolidated data sources that have many, many different reports combined into one sector-specific surveys, public disclosures, and our own proprietary data, which we have a lot of um, with all of the work that we've been doing in our region. So why would you want to compare to alternative careers? Why is a competitive market review the right way to do this? Well, this news article is from the US. It was released in July of 2022. In this man's case, he was trained as a teacher, and we know that teachers in the U.S., in many regions at least, are not very well paid in the public system. He was earning $43,000 U.S., and he quit teaching to work for $55,000 U.S. as a manager at Walmart. He, of course, also has the potential for some small bonuses there. The idea of comparing to alternative careers is not to determine what someone in childcare should be making. It's a data point to show what factors could be influencing the sustainability of the labor market in your sector. Because individuals make choices that are best for them and they always will. Therefore, understanding what other centers pay alone, just understanding what other centers would offer an employee, is not going to be very helpful if your employees decide to leave the sector entirely due to compensation concerns. So 
So for each of the child care rules in the, sec in the salary scales, we gathered the compensation rates for between five and seven actual Manitoba child care rules for 2022 to meet each of the MCCA rule classifications. Then we gathered the compensation data for varying roles outside of the sector to be considered. For more junior roles, we considered entry-level roles like bank tellers and customer service clerks. This chart shows only two of those that we considered for each of the roles. Now, for those employees with some training, we used the same general time frame of education and experience according to the guidelines for job matching that I just described. For ECEs, we considered roles that often include about two years of industry-specific training. In the insurance world, claims adjusters and benefit administrators, for example. So roles were considered from private, public, and not-for-profit roles. We chose, the, sorry, we chose the roles based upon similar scope of authority, training, and experience. And many of these roles have remained consistent in the comparator pools since we started working with MCCA in 2007. So they reflect how salaries have changed in those alternative careers over the years. I do want to note that the comparators for directors varied significantly as the scope of the roles are quite different according to the size of the center. Now this next table is an example of our data tables that we created as a starting point for the ranges, which we call a composite market review. We have removed the rates because the rates are proprietary data, but to illustrate our process, you'll note that we used both nonprofit and private comparators that had similar requirements in terms of training and experience. Then we used this data to create helpful ranges. We would pull four or maybe five sources of data to create a median. What we search for along the top are those labor market pieces. The number of employees is really important, but we look very closely at revenue in compensation best practices, which is one of the reasons why our scale includes different numbers for the leaders of different sized centers. We do want to get a good mix of industries where we can. And in this case, our child care role is already a composite of five or seven actual roles. So we then combine it with several alternatives. So we've got a, com a composite that is combined with other roles. The data is then used to create the target rate from which we would create a range um, you know, with a minimum and a maximum and range steps or levels. We do want to clarify that when we use multiple data points and put them together to understand or identify a single number, whether it's those five to seven actual child care rules or multiple data points for administrative coordinators, for example, we always use the median of those points. That is best practice instead of using the mean or the average. Again, the median is the value of the midpoint of the frequency distribution. Half of your data points are going to be above it. Half of your data points are going to be below it. So there's an equal probability of falling above or below. The median is not impacted by outliers. Very high or very low salaries can skew an average or a mean. So we do not use the average or the mean when we're figuring out these ranges. So in terms of using it, although you know we feel a lot of confidence in our process to establish these ranges, but we know that how you use them as a single employer is also so critically important and every organization is unique. What we would recommend to use the ranges is to be sure that you use your compensation philosophy and think of what else you offer. Things like paid time off, benefits, or perks. 
Um, make sure you understand how the target rate is used in your or own organization. So generally the target rate is considered appropriate for somebody who is fully proficient in their role. This means that they have the relevant experience and education to complete the duties of their roles, can complete all of their assigned tasks independently and without supervision or input from their leader. The minimum is typically appropriate for someone newly appointed to the role who perhaps does not have all of the experience or maybe doesn't have a full and complete education program required of the role. And for someone who maybe is still learning how to complete their duties or responsibilities. So you could consider that they would require more support from a leader. Now the minimum you should use with discretion and you need to look at each incumbent independently. For example, it may, may not make sense for somebody at the target rate as a CCA or ECE in training to move to the minimum of the ECE scale upon completion of their training. The minimum might not be appropriate for them. The maximum is appropriate to recognize and reward tenure. Somebody in this part of the range would be acting as a mentor to others, for example, who are more junior in the organization. Lastly, just remember that each role could be unique. Some people could be in charge of training or act as a backup for supervisors or how, you know, have some other unique addition to their roles that just might not be reflected in each of the role classifications. So helpful as the ranges are, make sure that you remember they need to fit within your own organization and all of those different factors need to be considered. So key factors in retention. When we talk about retention, um, we recognize and highlight that compensation is important, but it is far from all that affects the retention in your organization. We know that once people are in a job, they make decisions to stay or not stay based upon so many different factors. One of the most important is that sense of meaning or fulfillment, which we know is a big driver in the childcare industry. And then of course, the working environment and the culture, understanding how that workplace feels to someone and how much they feel that they belong. Leadership is a critically important factor as well as well as how they perceive the career opportunities and the development available to them. And then recognition for work well done. Compensation we've put at the end of this list. And it's hard to describe, but basically compensation is what we would sometimes consider to be table stakes. So there's a minimum level that must be met or it has to be right enough in order for other things to work. You could also think of it as the foundation upon which the other factors of retention are built. When it's not sufficient, when the compensation is wrong, all the other factors just can't work. When it is enough, people may not be fully satisfied with it, but then other factors in retention can be meaningful to them. When the compensation doesn't work for someone, nothing else can either. I hope that that is helpful to understand how compensation comes into play in retaining your employees. We so appreciate the ongoing partnership we, we have with MCCA, and I hope that I've been able to provide some useful background on the salary scales for your industry. Take good care. <laughs>